This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly. This episode of Know How is brought to you by Optical Cables by Corning. Corning's incredibly durable Thunderbolt and USB 3.0 optical cables are longer, thinner, lighter, and stronger. Go to opticalcablesbycorning.com to learn more. Today on Know How, Nanobox Reloaded. the know-how it's the twitch show where we build bend break and upgrade i'm father robert ballas here i'm patrick delahanty you may have noticed that that's not cranky hippo yeah it's the yeah. tall man this time it's patrick delahanty he's here at twit he is our programmer extraordinaire which yeah. is why we brought him in for a special little project yeah always a pleasure to be on know-how yeah yeah and now you you got to play with me last week we got to do this if yeah. you recall, this was sort of our, our throwback to the brick house. We brought a little something, <laughs> something, something that was going to get tossed out, which was just a lighting truss and this food grade tube that people may remember was the arch in the old brick yeah, house. It was a little Stargates. Yeah. Yeah. So I decided that we were going to take this, combine it with some of our Arduino know how and a string of SMD 5050 LEDs. And what we get is a very sort of passable prop that we have inside the producer's bullpen. Yeah. And you even improved it because before it was just blue. It now was just blue. you've actually got a sequence of colors in here. Right. But as we know, the nice thing about our Arduino projects is they don't have to just follow a set animation, which is what we're going to be showing the audience today. So what we yeah. want to do is we want to take the project Arduino Nano. This, this little thing, this modular box that we created so that you could take an Arduino Nano, combine it with a shell uh, of varying sizes, and then with a tray that looks a little bit like this. This gives you an all-in-one way to create a uh, very well, flexible program project box. Yeah, and it can be adapted for any number of things, not just food tubes with light. <laughs> food tubs, exactly. <laughs> but before we get to that, I did want to finish up on a couple of the hardware aspects of last week's project. Yeah. We were starting to run out of, out of time, so we went ahead and skipped ahead. Uh, remember, this is going to be using this particular template, which is four potentiometers and two buttons. But if you download the STL files from last week's show, you can make the control panel to be anything you want. You could have three potentiometers, no potentiometers. You wanted the little knife switch. Yeah. yeah. Knife switches are fun. Frankenstein. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and again, that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to give you something that was flexible enough for you to take the raw STL files, add the little templates that we've given to you, and then go off to the races. What I want to do is I want to take what we've done, what we've already created, and use these potentiometers to give people the ability to change individually the red, the green, and the blue channels. Yeah, and they can literally dial in whatever color they want. Precisely. Uh, in the future, we're also going to show them how to use some of the buttons. Like, for example, I want to have one that switches between auto playback, so it just does this, and dialing it in, which, you know, it's a nice thing. Uh, one thing we will do here is we're going to add a power disconnect. You may remember from our Aquabase project, there is a shortcoming of the Nano versus some of the other Arduinos, and that it's it's not really good with, uh, with power. What I mean is if you have your power circuits tied in and you don't have a diode in there to stop the reversal of power, when you plug in the USB, it actually tries to power the entire circuit off your USB bus. That's, that's not good. That actually burns out the Arduino. But does, does it have any application to use power off of USB? Is there a reason they have that in there? Uh, no, yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, a lot of our projects do run straight off of USB. You can, you can get you know, five watts. So if, as long as it's below 5 watts, you're fine. The problem is when you start hooking up things like uh, the, uh, the, the, what do you call them, the uh, power adapters, the yeah. uh, UBEX, it tries to power the UBEX from the wrong side. And right. then you end up drawing more current than the Arduino can handle. It, it won't kill it right away, but what you will notice is it gets incredibly hot until eventually it's yeah. blue smoke. So it's just stuff like this that's a problem. It's Precisely. Not, yeah, it's Precisely. not a defect. Yeah. No, for most people, it's just fine, especially if you're just breadboarding. But we're going to put in a disconnect circuit to make it really easy for you to switch between on mode and program mode. In other words, this green button, which is one of the on-off, it's not momentary. In fact, you can kind of hear it clicking. Um, what we'll do is we'll set it so that when you're programming, just make sure it's off 
and it completely disconnects the Arduino from power, saving you from any potential hazards of it bursting into flames like a Samsung Galaxy S7 Note. <laughs> that would never happen. That would never happen, yeah. All right, here we go. So if we look on the overhead, this is, this should look familiar to you if you watched last week's episode. Uh, this is our tray, which has our Arduino Nano. It also has our RGB strip driver. Oh, this is just held in there with hot glue. Uh, again, the original it design, works. I had a little mounting post to keep this in there, and it just kept snapping off. So I just figured, no, let's, let's not do that anymore. Yeah. Uh, over here, I've got my potentiometers tied into the panel, and then I've also got my buttons. Now, let me show you, because we didn't show you this last week. Uh, because the templates are so exact, this is the, the, the top, that's the front, the outside of the box, and this is the inside, these potentiometers just slide in. There's a little guide right here, that's the support, that keeps the potentiometer from, from turning, from the body, because you want the shaft to turn, not this. That little piece on the side locks it in, along with that hole in the design, which keeps your potentiometer body from turning, and rather just transfers the force directly to the shaft. Once you've got it in there, all you have to do, and once it's locked in, is take the washer, put it over the top, take one of the little, uh, what do you call these things? Uh, bolts, bolts, things, yeah. nuts. One of the nuts, put it over the top, and then once it's tight, you, you can go ahead and use a, a pair of pliers to squeeze it down, but I like to turn my pot all the way to one side and then angle that towards that side and now what I have is a potentiometer that gives me that range. It's very nice. It's, it's super easy to install this. Same thing with the buttons. These buttons have been designed for this particular template. You just drop it in. And on the back side, there's a little nut that closes up. Now, we did design this project to be modular, but you do have to watch out for this. You're going to need a little bit of clearance between the potentiometer tines and whatever else you want to run down here. What you don't want is you don't want these so close that you have to bend the pins just to make the wires fit. That's a really good way to get yourself some shorts. Yeah, and so you have to be careful of which way you orient that potentiometer so it's not going into the wall. Precisely. I mean, if you are going to use a lot of potentiometers, what you can do is you can actually uh, do something like this. You'd, you'd rotate this. In, in Tinkercad, which is where we designed it, you would rotate the entire design so that rather than going straight down, you could, say, make it go off to the side like that. And you would just continue that down the row, and it would free up a little bit of space. Yeah. For me, because I designed the box so big, I really don't have to do that. Eventually, when you do enough of these, you get something that looks like that, which is what we want. Yeah. Uh, now, I do want to continue something that we, we started last week, and that was to make this thing modular, to make it flexible, because we don't want to be tied to this. We don't want this to be, oh my gosh, now I can't remove it at all. Yeah. We used these jumpers so that I can completely separate the panel from the lower tray, and these are all quick connect, so I can just take these out, like so. And then what I have, and uh, you remember this from last week, yeah. is I have, this is a keyed shell, so I cannot install this backwards. If I try to install it backwards, it actually looks funny. Let me, actually, yeah, it won't let me, fit. Let me see if, uh, if I can make it backwards. No, that's the right way. Let's turn it around. <laughs> right. There we go. See, so if I turn it backwards, if you go to the side view here, uh, Kara, there you go. No, side view. Side view. Side. There we go. So if you look at that, you'll see how this, this is offset. It doesn't line up quite right. The, and that, that will tell you that you've installed it backwards. And all you have to do is take it, flip it, install it the right way. And because everything is keyed on the inside, it actually creates this nice solid box. And then what I would do is I would make all my connections up top. If you go back to the overhead, Kara, I would do my connections up top. And then I would just assemble the panel uh, uh, way more neatly than this. <laughs> yeah, way, match it all in there. Way the heck That's... more neatly than this. This is, just, this is just for show. And the panel actually fits down on the top. And I've tapered the screw holes. So once you get everything installed, this is a, uh, a nice, complete, neat project box. Yeah, yeah right. very clean. So let's finish the electronics, because we do want to do one thing. And that is, we want to add a power disconnect. But I also want to keep the ability to just pull everything out. I don't ever want to be in the situation where something has to be desoldered in order to remove the, the, the top panel. Yeah, so you can easily take out parts and use them in other projects, borrow them for other things you're doing. Yeah, yeah. All right, here we go. So what we need is this. This line right here is the line that's going to go to our Arduino. 
This is our little universal battery eliminator circuit. It's going to take 12 volts on this side. It feeds 12 volts via these two wires into our LED strip driver. It gets turned into 5 volts in the UBAC, and then I need 5 volts two places. This place, this, this cable goes to my potentiometers. I need to, to provide parallel 5 volt to all the potentiometers in the circuit. This, these are the two jumpers that go to providing power to my Arduino. Uh, so I've got my, uh, my ground and my 5 volt line here. What I want is I want to interrupt this line so that I can disconnect the, uh, the power from the Arduino altogether. So in other words, when I push this button right here, I don't want any more power to get out of or into the Arduino, which means I can plug in my USB cable and it won't try to feed the circuit. Right. And you want it when you have it pressed in, there's no power, correct? Uh, no, so I want oh, it. You want to so it's just like an, an on off okay. switch. So that's on, that's off. That's off, off. okay. Right. Position matters. Yeah, this one's momentary. So this one doesn't have a position. It's just every time you push it, it's going to close the circuit. This one, when I do this, circuit is closed. When I do that, circuit is open. Right. All right. But I don't want to cut into this because I just made this harness. I'm going to kind of cheat. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use an additional jumper cable, which I have right here. Uh, and it's male and female, so it's an extension cable. It has a pin on one side. There we, uh, maybe if you go to the side view. It has a pin on one side. There you go. A pin on one side and the female connector on the other. I'm going to cut this in half, and I'm going to solder this to the button, which will allow me to just pass through power. Oh, right. Yeah, a whole lot easier. It, it means I don't have to cut open the circuit I've already made, uh, and uh, essentially two solders and a little bit of heat shrink tubing, and I'm done. Yeah. So let's, let's do this. So all I have to do is this. And actually, my heat shrink tubing went away. Yeah. My guess is it's on Burke's desk. But that's OK. That's OK. We're not going to use it for this one. So a quick strip and solder job. Uh, by the way, folks, if you're going to be doing a lot of this, get yourself some nice tools. Uh, people have been sending me videos of them stripping wires with scissors. Oh, no, no, no. It works. <laughs> but, no, don't do it. Because what, what you'll end up doing is you'll end up striking the copper conductors, and you'll tear a few of them away. Uh, it's just, no. Well, then you also accidentally cut the wires a yeah. lot. I've done that. Yeah, it's not and, great. And it's not great. Yeah. Get yourself, and these are cheap. These are like $3 on Amazon. Super yeah. easy to use, yeah. and then you get nice looking wires. Let's go ahead and turn on our little soldering station here. It's gonna, I love how fast this thing heats up. I actually think this uses radio frequency. It doesn't use standard heating coil. Uh, so like always, we're gonna wanna tin our wires because any time we're soldering, uh, we like to pretend, which makes it easier when we actually end up soldering our, uh, our wires to the pads on the buttons. Come on, stay in there. There we go. So 230 degrees. And I'm also going to prep this. I'm going to go ahead and take this button out. Because what I want is I want to be able to cleanly solder this. I don't want all the other wires around it to uh, get in the way. Uh, actually, oh, come here. Oh, what you doing? I probably should have done this before the show, but you know what? That's what I like yeah. about this show. It's know-how. This is, this is how we do it. All right. We are at 350 degrees. We're ready to solder. Let's go ahead and tin. So a little bit of clearing. Uh, grab my solder up top here. Uh, again, I like to put a little bit of solder onto my iron just because it, it makes heat transfer a little bit easier. I'm not applying the solder to the iron, I'm applying it to the wire. So once the wire is hot enough, it will flow the solder on its own, and I get a nice, clean copper. Ooh, look at that. It's so cute. Yeah, let's do this one, too. Kara does not agree. Yeah. You know what, Kara? You're surrounded by nerds. Get used to it. All right. So that gives me that. A little bit of white. And let's go ahead and tin the button as well, because I've, I want to connect it to those. Actually, this is nice. This has a little through hole, so I can just do this. Oh, yeah, that makes it easy. It makes it really simple. You're not supposed to, because this puts undue stress on the copper, but um, I'm going to do it. Why? Because I'm a rebel. That's why they put the holes there. Well, <laughs> yeah, kind of, but maybe not. All I know is it makes it a lot easier when I want to attach wires to it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, this will carry the entire current. All the, the power that's being used by the Arduino will go through this, but the Arduino uses so little. Uh, you really you don't right. need super heavy gauge wires here. So let's do this. Um, I, 
I don't know if that's that's not big enough. So no. just hold it. Uh, yeah, you know what? Here, you you are my helping hand. Ta da! All right, so, what are we gonna do? Really see that. It's okay. It's close enough. They know what we're doing. Oh, that's a good shot. Thank you. There we go. Okay, and so we're gonna take the other side. Again, I'm not putting heat, I'm not, I'm not applying it to the iron, I'm applying it to the pad, which once it's warm enough, will flow solder. I'm actually, Oops. I'm gonna flow solder on the bottom side of this as well. Just to be thorough. Hey, let go. There we go. All right. There we go. And again, as we always say, the disclaimer, please don't, don't tell Smitty about this because he is my spirit animal and he will make fun of my soldering job. All right. <laughs> now, if, uh, if my heat shrink tubing hadn't ended up on Burke's desk, what we, I would have done is I would have added two little lengths of heat shrink tubing to this. I'm relatively okay with doing this because I've insulated everything. There's nothing to touch it. Yeah, and um, those won't touch each other. They won't touch each other, but just know uh, typically you, you would want to insulate yeah. that. All right, so I'm going to put this back in here. And this now gives me a way, a very easy way, to push a single button and know, because I have visual feedback of whether or not the Arduino is getting power, whether or not it's connected to the, uh, to the UBAC. Uh, disconnecting it is the easiest way to make sure that I'm not going to end up releasing blue smoke when I want to reprogram this thing. Yeah. You may remember that we did the same thing in the Aquavase, the Arduino in the Aquavase, and the way that we did it there was I just had uh, banana connectors. So you could remove the banana connectors when you were programming and it ensured that power wouldn't go backwards through the system. Uh, and the other way to do this, and this is the way I would do it if I had the right components, is you just put an LED in there because the LED won't allow the power to go backwards. Right. Yeah, but, you know, yeah, that's who we are. But All right, so what they do. this gives us the complete assembly of the panel. What we need to do now is we need to teach the Arduino how to read these values. Yeah. And folks, that's not necessarily the easiest thing to do. That's software. That's software, which is why we've got Patrick Delahanty here. We're gonna talk about that this. in just a moment, but first, let's go ahead and take a break to thank the sponsor of this episode of Know How. Are you looking for acoustic perfection? Because if you are, you need to find a way to get those noisy peripherals, those bits and bytes that make a bit too much sound away from your work environment. Oh, in the old day, we would use parallel and serial extenders. We would find ways to, to put our devices in the other room. In fact, I, I remember once I drilled a hole through the wall so I could put the tower in one room and then the, the keyboard, the mouse, and the monitor in my room. Well, folks, we don't really have that option anymore. With super high-speed buses, you can't really fudge on the spec or you just lose that speed. That was the reason why you bought that new device in the first place, which is why we're so happy to have optical cables by Corning to give us our speed. Now this is what they look like. It's a self-contained kit that includes everything you need to extend your Thunderbolt or your USB 3.0 connections. Oh, the secret is in here. I know these look like standard Thunderbolt connectors, but really this is a transceiver. It allows you to take that electrical impulse and turn it into light. And light will travel much further without degradation. And because they're cables by Corning, this fiber optic that is one of the technologies that really they help to mature, it means that it's going to be nearly bulletproof. Now, if you did this with an old fiber, that would shatter the glass all the way up and down, but they've designed theirs to be basically bulletproof. You can walk on it, you can bend it, you can even tie it in knots, and you'll still get all the speed that you did when it was perfectly straight. Now, they give you incredibly strong and flexible and long runs. With Thunderbolt, you can get up to 60 meters. That's 200 feet. With USB 3, you can get 50 meters. That's 165 feet and still have that full throughput back and forth. Our optical cables by Corning will help you achieve that acoustic and electrical isolation, which means that you can enjoy a clutter-free, peaceful work environment. You don't have to believe me. You can actually go to a company that does this for a living. Universal Audio relies on these cables to give them a perfect acoustic environment. If they're testing devices, they can't have the testing device itself create noise, which is why they use optical cables by Corning to put all their noisy peripherals away from their testing workspace. If they trust Corning, don't you think you should too? 
Instead of investing in multiple extenders, adapters, and cables, turn to optical cables by Corning to establish the connection that you need with one simple long-length cable. They are available at all major electronics and professional AV retailers, including Apple Stores, Amazon, B&H, and more. Optical cables by Corning are longer, thinner, lighter, and stronger. Go to opticalcablesbycorning.com to learn more. And we thank Corning for their support of know-how. All right, so now what we need to do is we need to show you the code that's actually going to be loaded onto this Arduino. We've got the little Nano in its project box. We've semi-assembled it. I've gone ahead and hooked up the potentiometers. So I've got, uh, again, if you watched the last episode, I've got a single pin off of the wiper of each one of these three potentiometers hooked into analog one, analog two, and analog three on the Arduino. I've also got this, which is providing five volt power in parallel to the potentiometers. And again, let me repeat this because this was a hard learned lesson from personal experience. Do not wire these in series. If you wire the potentiometers in series, what will happen is you'll get enough of a drop every time you adjust them that it's going to affect all three potentiometers. It just goes crazy. It just goes crazy. You end up with values all over the place. In fact, that's going to be part of our programming. Uh, the first thing we want to do is we want to show you the program that we used to make this. So if you just wanted to have a nice smooth animation, this is the way to do it. And remember, we're using 5050s instead of the standard WS2812 that we like because they're individually addressable because these are so much cheaper. Five meters of 300 LEDs cost me under $9. Five meters of WS2812 with 300 LEDs is going to cost you about $33 to $35. Uh, so if you're looking for a bargain, this is definitely the way to go. All right, this is the code for just the animation. Super simple. You've actually seen this. We did this a long time ago when people asked us how we could interface 5050s with an Arduino. This is going to include this. This is a library that we will include. When you download the files for this episode, you just go ahead and add that. And the way that you add that is you go to Tools, oh, sorry, no, uh, to Sketch, Include Library, and then you manage the library or add the zip file, and it will automatically add that library into your, your sketch environment, your, your IDE. Now we need to define a few things. Specifically, we need to tell the Arduino where it can find the connection to the LED RGB strip driver that we've included in the project. There's two things it needs. It needs the clock pin, and it needs the DIO pin, the digital IO pin. So we're going to tell it that the clock for the RGB strip driver is on digital pin three, and the digital input output is on digital line two, digital pin two. Now we need to initialize that driver. So when we, when we uh, start up our project, it needs to know A, what library am I using? B, what pins am I gonna be addressing the hardware that that library deals with? And then C, or three, or whatever I was doing, uh, you need to turn it on. And so in this particular case, I'm saying, okay, go into the RGB driver library, turn on the function, or activate the function called driver, and pass it those two parameters that I just gave you, the parameters for the clock and the digital input output. Uh, a few things I'm doing, and, and I'm, the reason why I'm doing it here is because, Patrick, have you noticed anything about these variables? Uh, besides that they're colors? Oh, the fact that, that they're not inside of a function, so they're global. Oh, oh yeah, they're... Yeah. Well, that's just lazy programming. This is very lazy programming, and I, you know... But a, I'm guessing you did, this, yeah, you did this last night. Very late very, last night. Very quick. Super, super quickly. Uh, global variables, uh, do we like them, Patrick? No. Why don't we like them, Patrick? Uh, they eat up memory. They eat up memory and also... And, uh, very inefficient. Inefficient and, and very insecure. I mean, if yeah. you... If, and now, this is one thing, because it's going to be on an Arduino that is air-gapped from everything. But we've talked about this before. When people make a project and then they evolve it and say, oh, you know what? It would be great if I could control this over the Internet. Suddenly, oh, it's, yeah, someone else this. has access to it. And if they know that you're using global variables, you've just made a huge security hole in your Internet of Thing thing. So... Don't do that. Don't do yeah. what I'm doing, folks. Somebody might take over the colors of your lights. It would be okay. tragic. <laughs> this is true. And, and you know what? For most of my projects, it's like, oh, so you're going to control my cyber goggles? Yeah. Awesome. Somebody just turned on your lights over there for I your know. plants. So they're, they're hacking in. Watch but out. <laughs> I've got an Arduino Nano that is running the automated irrigation in my room, in my grow room. So can you imagine someone gets into that and says, hey, you know what? Never turn off. Let's make it rain. Oh, no. I mean, basically, I come back from being away for six weeks, and my house is now a pool. Is that what happened when you came back from Germany? No, that was different. Okay. That, was, that wasn't a, a hack. That was, um, 
That was me with just that was using global variables. <laughs> Actually, that might have been. I haven't <laughs> been able to narrow it down. So my my little uh, automated irrigation system. It has two vats. One is for pure water, and one is for water mixed with nutrients. And mm -hmm. it, it mixes them together and then gives them to the plant. For some reason, halfway when I through my trip, it flipped them. It flipped the pins. So it was triggering the one that was almost pure nutrients and dumping that into my plants, um, which okay. they don't like. That they all burn. Huh. Well, all the ones in that tent burn. The other ones are fine. <laughs> go figure. Okay, so uh, let's go back to this. I've got, uh, I've got nothing in setup because I'm not opening up any serial ports. I'm not doing any debugging. All I'm doing is I'm, and here's my main program. My program is fade. So the, the, remember, in, in Arduino, void loop is the instruction that it will do over and over and over again. Yeah. It will, as long as you turn it on, you have power to it, it will try to execute loop. We try to keep as much of our code out of that segment as possible. This is just good programming. This is how you make yeah. it object-oriented. I can reuse it if I make it a standalone function. In this particular case, I have a function called fade. That means I could add this function to a library or I could copy and paste it into any of my future projects. And as long as I have everything from here to here, that function will work. Yeah, and so this fade could be inserted, you could insert another function for blink, another function for Precisely. something else. And you could go through the sequence. Exactly. It fades, and then it blinks, mm -hmm. and then whatever. And this is exactly what uh, my steampunk goggles do. So in, if you look right. at the code for my steampunk goggles, there's actually very little in loop. All there is is there's a selector. So it calls out to the switch and says, what position are you in? Depending on the position, it calls the function that's associated with that position. That's, that's what okay. you want. Okay. But the fade function itself, is, there's nothing special about this. Super, super simple. I mean, let me walk you through the logic here. It's a series of for loops. In this particular case, I'm saying for red. And remember, I declared red up above. It's a global variable, even though it really doesn't have to be. For red, which it starts off as, as one, up to red is less than 255. So from one to 255, this loop is going to run. This for loop is going to run. Then it opens up the driver. So this is the, uh, the driver that accesses the, LE, the uh, RGB strip driver. It's going to send a value. In this particular case, it's going to send red, blue, green, which again, are those global variables that I declared up front. Right. But then, here's the fun part. After it sends it, when it sends it by, by ending the driver, it's going to be red equals red plus one. So it's incrementing the value of red. OK, and what happens when red reaches uh, a really large number. What, what, in this particular case, when red hits 254, that's the last time it's going okay. to run. This, this is, I've set this to auto uh, increment. Uh, it will delay, it will wait just a bit, and once this for loop is complete, so red is at now at full value, it's going to go to the next for loop. And the next for loop is the same thing but with blue. Blue starts at 1, this keeps running until it hits 254, and then it stops. Mm -hmm. Once blue has started, it will start turning on green and it'll go green until green is at full value, and then it stops. And then I have three more loops that take it back. So this one starts off with red at full value, will continue until red is equal to one, and it goes down. So it'll start decreasing the, the level of red in the ah. string. So it's, uh, if you, so if, it, it turns, it, if you think of it as these knobs, it would turn red all the way up, then turn green all the way up, then turn blue all the way up, and then it would start turning red down. Precisely. It, so if you look at the order here, it's yeah. from, from off, from yep. no color to red slowly going from dim all the way up to full brightness. Then while red is at full brightness, it will slowly increase blue until it's at full brightness. And then with blue and red at full brightness, it will slowly increase green until it's full brightness. And at that point, it's white. That's as white it's going to get. That's, yeah. that's full color on all, uh, full value on, on all colors that are in the string. Then it starts decreasing. It starts subtracting red until red's at zero. It starts subtracting blue until blue is at zero. And it starts subtracting green until green's at zero and the string is off. And, and that's what we get. I can actually see it in here because it does red. And then you can see it adding the blue, adding the green. And then it gets the bright white. And then right. it goes down. And then finally, it, it's off for brief, yeah, it's super like brief second. nanosecond, now, and then if, red again. If I wanted to, I could do something like this. I could add a statement here at the end. So this is when everything is back off. I could put delay, and I could say delay 1,000. And what that will do is it will wait 
a long, long time before it starts the next loop. No, it's a thousand uh, milliseconds. milliseconds okay. Yeah, so it's a second. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah, not that long, but in programming time, yeah. Uh, so again, super simple, and you can make this any way you want. You don't have to do what I did. You don't have to go red, blue, green. You could go red up, then red down, then blue up, then blue down, then green up, then green down, yeah. and then combinations. It's entirely up to you. We just made this to show you how, how a super simple animation can be used with the strip driver. And this same anim uh, animation is what you've got going through the... the yeah, so th this code is actually on a nano project box down below, okay. uh, running, running this little lighting fixture in the back. Yeah. Something I will mention, though, is that's fun because we like automated lighting, but what if I wanted finer control? I yeah. Mean, I, I built it in my project box, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so you, you want to be able to control, like, oh, I just want it red now. Like we do on our sets here. We'll have different colors Precisely. for different sets. Precisely. Uh, luckily, I have just the thing. In my project box, I've got these three potentiometers. I'm going to set it so that this one controls red, this one controls green, and this one controls blue. So it's RGB, red, green, blue. And I'll be able to dial those up and down to set the exact color that I want rather than having it go through a loop. Yeah, and so it, and it will hold at that color. It will hold in that color. Well, we're going to see that's, that's a challenge of dealing with analog inputs. Let's go ahead and show you the first step. The first step is I need to get the input. I need to get a value from an analog circuit. It's not digital. An analog circuit and turn it into digital, something that I can put into the, uh, the programming for the drivers. Because the driver will only understand between 0 and 254, or 1, 255. That's, it, do, it doesn't matter anything else. It just wants to know how high do you want me to set the level for this particular color. In order for me to do that, I'm going to have to do a read. But in order for me to do the read, I have to calibrate my potentiometers. Now, people have asked me what kind of potentiometers we use. I'm using 20K. So it's, it goes from basically complete infinite resistance, which means no voltage is passing through, all the way up to I'm getting 5 volts on, and it's doing it in 20, uh, 20 increments. But you can use any potentiometer you want to use as long as you calibrate. Let me show you what calibration means. If you go to my screen here, this is the same, uh, uh, the also, oh, by the way, we've been getting questions, what kind of language is this? This is Sketch, this is Arduino, it's basically C. So if you know C, you know how to do this. All right, so I, uh, unlike before, we are going to be using a setup line because we want to turn on the serial port. We're, we're setting it for 9600 baud, because I need to get feedback from the Arduino, um, it, because I need to, to set the calibration for my, uh, for my potentiometers. I have this, int, so it's creating an integer variable called pin 1. And into that variable, I am doing this. I'm calling the function called analog read, which is built in. This is built into to Arduino's environment. And I'm passing it the value of 1. So I'm telling the Arduino, read pin 1 and put that value into the integer I created called pin 1. And then I'm going to repeat that for pin 2 and pin 3, because remember, I need 3. I mm -hmm. need red, I need green, and I need blue. So I'm going to read pin 1, I'm going to read pin 2, and I'm going to read pin 3. Then I'm going to output it. And this is going to allow me to see those values on my computer. I'm going to open up a serial monitor, which will read the values being sent back from the Arduino when I move the, the wipers. So uh, let's go ahead. I'm going to overwrite the animation code that we have up right now. Uh, make sure this is going to the right one. Nano at mega palm 3. There we go. And send. So down below, you'll see it's compiling. And then you'll see some white text. And when you see the white text, it means, OK, good, it's uploading. And it's, oh, done uploading. So what's going to happen is you'll notice the animation has stopped. The RGB strip driver has basically been deprived of, of any input. It's not doing anything anymore. Uh, but if I go back to my computer and I open up a serial monitor, I get this. These, this is the real-time values that it's getting from this potentiometer. So let me go ahead and move around just oh. to show. See the, oh, no, you have to go. There we go. So I can change this one, this one, and this one. You'll notice they all end at 1023. And so 1023 is, that's full voltage coming through. Yeah. And then coming all the way down. I can bring them down. Problem is, 
I can't actually use the value of 1023 because what value can I use? I can go up to 200, 200, 255. 255 right, yeah. So 255. I need a way to change that so that I can map it all the way up and down of the value of the resistor, the value of the potentiometer. In this particular case, uh, I'm going all the way from 0 to 1023. 0 to 1023 and 0 to 1023. This is not always the case. This is why I said you need to calibrate. You might buy potentiometers. Some of them are kind of junky. You can still mm -hmm. use them, but maybe they don't go all the way to zero. Yeah. yeah. Well, I noticed that these even, you turn them down to zero and there'd be a few ones coming through. Yeah. yeah actually, here, Carex, if you go back, you'll notice, okay, so I'm not moving anymore. But the value on that is fluctuating. And the reason why it's fluctuating is because the Arduino is taking the best guess. It's taking the, the analog level, the voltage level coming into that port, and it's converting it into a number. Well, it's not going to be the same every time it samples. This is, we're going to see in the next part of this project, that's going to be a little bit problematic. Yeah. 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 Could be. But in this particular case, I know that I can go from 0 to 1023 on all of these potentiometers, that's going to be very important. You need to run this on your potentiometers because yours might go from 70 to 800. And you need to know that because if you have values that are out of the range of that potentiometer, it means you've got values that you can never activate. Yeah, and you need to be able to error check for that. And right. see, because you don't want to say, oh, I'll assume it's 255 and yep. it's sending in 1023. Yep. Precisely, precisely. Everything blows up. Exactly. Yeah. And actually, uh, where it really goes bad when you're doing things with the strip driver is if you send it negative values, it, oh. it doesn't know what to do. In fact, what it will do, you'll see this, like it'll, it'll come down, it'll come down, and then go full value again because it, it thinks, oh. I guess I'm looping around. Ah. Uh, this, this is something that you need to do. We've included this little piece of code. So if you buy yourself some potentiometers, just run the calibration really, really quickly. It just takes a couple of minutes and write down what the lowest value and the highest value is recorded for your particular potentiometer. But you should probably code for beyond that, yes. just in case. We're going to talk you, about that. You turn it down, maybe you get a negative value. You only saw zero, but you get a plan. What happens if a negative one comes through? Precisely. And we call that sanitizing. You know, yeah, you always want to check your values. That's QA. QA. It's standard. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't do it. And in, in fact, the, uh, the cyber goggles, the steampunk goggles, yeah. I actually did run into that, out of range errors. Uh, uh, now, yeah. it was really easy for me because all I had to do was reset the power. But I mean, if I had been designing that for actual production, that would be an issue. You don't, you yeah. don't want it to randomly just shut off because it, re it received one erroneous value out of thousands it gets per second and says, I don't know what to do, I'm halting. Yeah. All right. We're going to take the calibration data and we're actually going to show you the code that you need to be able to enable your potentiometers. So now we know how we're going to get our input in from the potentiometers. That wiper is sending a particular voltage between 0 and 5 volts. The Arduino is turning that into a digital value. Uh, we did notice that that value was fluctuating just yeah. a tiny bit, right? But what we can do is we can use what we used with the uh, steampunk goggles, and that is to map it. So what we're going to do is we're going to tell it that between 0 and 1023, which were the minimum and the maximum values of that potentiometer, I want you to automatically do the math for me between 0 and 255. So it's just reducing. The it's reducing, and right. Then, yeah, yeah, down to so an even number. Let me show you how that works. So going number. back to my computer, uh, we've got what we had for the auto example. So I'm including the library. I'm defining the clock and the digital input out pin. I'm initializing the driver. I'm turning on the serial port because I'm going to be doing a little bit of debugging. But then I've got this in my loop. I'm creating an integer. I'm calling it pin 1. And then I'm going to do an analog read, just like we did before, of pin 1. I'm now going to take that value and into the new value called LED value 1, I'm going to use the function map. And as I mentioned before, what map does is it says, OK, map the value inside of pin 1. And that was the value that I got from my potentiometer. And give it the range of, 10, of 0 to 1020. I didn't use 1023 because I, I wanted to give it a little bit of leeway at the top. Uh, it, you, you have bad things that happen when you, when you uh, put the wrong value. Uh, but, but what would happen if the 1023 came through? Because you're only looking at... It would 20. crash it, which is why the next example, oh, okay. we're going to do a little bit of error checking. Uh, and then the next set of numbers here is from 0 to 255. So it, the nice thing about this is in, in like a, when I was coding in Python, I actually had to figure out which values corresponded with which values I wanted. In this particular case, it's built in there. 
it will zero is going to be zero. 1020 is going to be 255. This will figure out for me all the values inside and what level they should be between 0 and 255. And that's a built-in function? That's a built-in function. That's pretty sweet. That's, yeah, I really like it. it I use this a lot all of time. the time. It yeah. really does. And I'm going to do the same thing for pin 2 and for pin 3. So what I've got now is it's checked all three pins, so all three potentiometers. It's gotten that value between 0 and 200, uh, 1023, and it's remapped that value to something between 0 and 255. There we go. Right. Once I get that, I open the driver, I send those values. So each of these are the values of 0 to 255, and then driver end, which pushes it down the line to the strip driver, which turns on that particular color. Okay. Now, I've also added this. This is just debug code. You could take this out when you get to your final iteration, but I want to know what are the values I'm sending down the strip. So let's open it up. Let's actually, first let's upload this. Same thing, it's going to compile the sketch, and then when we start to see white lines down here, it means that it's starting to upload. And then I'll get a little done up, now it's done uploading. So what's going to happen is, actually, Kara, if you come back over to the overhead. It changed color. Yes, and oh. I now have the ability with these potentiometers, I can now change the colors. But you have, have you control. noticed? Have you noticed something about this like weirdness with this? Oh, what's going on? See, that should be off. Oh. This is that negative number thing I was talking right. about. So it, it's actually gone so low that it loops back over. So, so I, like for example, here, let me turn these down. Turn red and, so now it's just green. And as I decrease, it's gonna decrease, There's decrease, a bit of flicker decrease, there. decrease, it's flickering like crazy. And then when I get, all, oh, boom. So I've hit a negative number. So I, I need to fix this. But yeah. more than that, and you can't really see it on the stream, but you can, Patrick. Yeah, Th these colors are flickering. Really bad flicker. It's real, and what, what's happening is, if we go to the monitor here, on my computer, you'll notice it, this is the remapped value. So this is not the value we're getting off the potentiometer. This is the value we're getting from the Arduino recomputing uh, what value it is. And notice how how high and low. So that's three, four, three, four, three, four, three, four. Three, four. The middle one is going crazy. It's all the way down from like. 17 all the way up to 28. And this one, the green one, yeah, it just, it just jumps. It's, this is the problem with using analog input. I'm going to get jumps from one, one reading to the next. I may not even touch the thing, and it will be jumping back and forth, because that's the nature of having an analog input. Yeah. Yeah, not, not particularly useful, not particularly great. And uh, again, you can't see it here, but in person, this would give me a headache because this thing—it's—if yeah. it's, that was going through this uh, meat tube, then uh, this would be terrible. Precisely, precisely. So there must be a way to fix this, Patrick. What do you think it's going to be? I think that we need, would need to take an average of these numbers hmm. and uh, just kind of, you know, take a range and. Uh, kind of standardize it so that we're not blinking back and forth between multiple values. Precisely. So what we want to do is we want to say take 10 readings for a particular pin. And yeah, we may have those erroneous readings like it's going 99940, 99990, 99, okay? Yeah, we're going to throw out that junk. That's... Well, we're going to get you know, we're going to do that later. Eventually we want to do uh, an average but get away from the deviated mean. So we're going to okay. chop off the top and the bottom. But for now, we can probably get away with just taking an average. So I'd say like take 10, 20, 30 values, take the average of it, and then we get something that's not going to fluctuate up and down quite as much. Where if there's a big change, it's not going to affect the numbers that much. Precisely. And oddly enough, I actually wrote that already. Oh. I know. Go convenient. figure, right? So if you go back to my screen, so this is the smooth version of the uh, RGB driver. Everything up top looks the same. So we are using this library. We're defining our clock as three. Our digital input output is two. We are initializing the driver. We're starting the serial port. Uh, this is a debug function. So this allows me just to call a function that will automatically report to me the values that I'm getting for red, blue, and green. Now, inside of my loop, there's a little weirdness going on. First of all, I got rid of those global variables. Now they only exist within the loop, which is what we right. want. This is going to do a little bit of error checking. Uh, so it's going to call the, uh, the, the, uh, the reading function. Oh, actually, hold on. I, yeah, there we go. Uh, it calls the reading function, and then it's going to check it. So it will not let it go below 0, and it will not let it go above 1020. 
If it gives me a value that's below zero, it sets it to zero. If I, it gives me a value above 1020, it sets it for 1020. So automatically, that's going to chop off the weirdness at the top and the bottom of the range. Yeah, no more negative numbers. No more negative numbers. But this is the real magic. So red equals a map. This is the same function. But I'm not just calling a variable. I'm calling a function. So map the value I get back from the function called read pin and pass it 1. So I'm saying read pin 1 to that function. And down below, we see what that function does. Here's, here's the read pin function. And uh, I've got some weirdness going on here. So I'm creating an array. This is how big I want my array to be. So I'm saying take 30 cells, make this array 30 cells large. The next one creates that array. The next one is the index, because remember, arrays work with indexes. I'm not, it's, right. it's variable, but it's a lot of variables. It's actually 30 variables under the same name with an index attached to it. Uh, do you, have you ever tried to explain that to, to people? Oh, yes, it's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy. Just remember, I'm creating a single string of data under the same name, but I can access 30 different cells in that array by using the index, so from 0 all the way up to 29. Okay. Right. The next part of this. I'm creating a total, and again, this is totally commented. So this is where we store the cumulative value of all the cells. And then this is going to give me my average. And this is the value that we're going to end up returning. So here's how it works. I have, a, I have a for loop, actually two for loops. The first for loop will run from the value index, which starts off at 0. And it will run until the value index is less than, just less than the array size, which means it will run 30 times. And every time it runs, it's going to take a reading from the analog pin, and it's going to put that value into that array, into that, that indexed cell of the array. Does that make sense so far? Yes. All right. The second for loop is going to go back through the array that I just created and filled, and it's going to add up all the numbers. That's all it's doing. So it's going through mm -hmm. every single one of those values, and total is equal to total plus the value of the next cell. So if I have 30 cells and every one of them has a value of 10, it means that I've got uh, 300 values. And it's going to add all 300 of those uh, values until I get, I'm sorry, it's going to add, yeah. it's going to have a total, total of 300. 300 oh yes. my goodness, yeah. And it's then. Divided by the array size. Precisely. Which is 30. Yeah. So which means 10, that if I've got a couple of those that are going up or down, they should balance each other out. Yeah. All right. And then it's going to return that number. And that's the number that the program up top is going to use to determine how the LED should be set. So let's go ahead and upload this. And it's going to compile it and push it. Dun, dun, dun. So this means that every 30, 30 reads 30 reads that comes off of this is now changed to one read. Precisely. So if you come but back to the But it's the overhead. average of those 30. So now let's go full brightness. And Patrick, you can notice there's, yeah. I mean, there's still a little bit of flicker, but it's so much smoother oh, than yeah. it used to be. It's not intolerable anymore. Right. So let's turn that down. I'll get blue. Oh, nice I'll purple there. And you'll notice that even when I go all the way down, I'm not getting that weirdness. Yeah. So I've error checked it, so it's not going to go back to full oh. brightness. It will flicker because remember, if there's enough of a, of, yeah. if it maintains the, the faulty input over several cells, it will kick in. But this is about as smooth as we're going to be able to get from an analog input. And this is really how we should be designing all of our analog input projects from now on. Take the average because it's not going to be precise. Yeah, and, uh, but there's still ways you could reduce the flicker even more, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah there, oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, the best way to remove the flicker would be to actually not allow it to change range that quickly. Yeah. So you say, OK, you know what? If you want to go from 0 to 255, I'm not going to let you jump directly. I'm, there's going to be a smooth ramp up. Although then it might be hard to adjust your colors it because be. there's a bit because of a delay. Because there'll be a lag. There'll yeah. be a bit of lag. And Dr. Morbius is asking why we're, I'm storing the values in the array. It's because there's actually an add-on to this project in a couple of weeks, and oh. I want you to have this. Oh, really? Yeah. We're going we're gonna to get, we're gonna get kind of crafty with this. this. Again, it's a work in progress, but something that does work really well. Let me go ahead, uh, last bit, we, let's show you the serial monitor. So this is our debug values, and you'll notice they are still jumping, but they jump a whole lot less. So if I, if, like if I turn this down, you know, I'm going 144 to 146 rather than 130 up to 150. Yeah. 
it was a huge range before, but now it's a lot smaller. Mm -hmm. This is also a very useful view if uh, if you start to wonder if your hardware is, is dying, because potentiometers will degrade over time and they'll start giving erroneous mm -hmm. voltages. Uh, and if you see, even with, with this averaging, if you see your values jumping all the way up and down, it's probably your potentiometer. You may have to change that out. You may have a bad wiper. You, it just may be worn down. Right. Yeah. Well, folks, we know that this was a lot of information to take in in one episode. Hopefully, you combine this with what you got off of the Project Nanobox episode one, and it's giving you some useful ideas for uh, building your own projects. Remember, we've got all the STL files and all the code at our show notes. If you go there, you'll be able to download them, modify the STLs to fit your particular project, and modify the code to control whatever it is that you want to control. Patrick, where do they go for that? They can go to twit.tv slash kh. That's the official know-how website on the twit.tv site. Now, you're, you're our developer. All the back episodes are there. They so. are. But you actually have a different URL, because you made twit.tv slash kh work, but what's the real one? Uh, twit.tv slash shows slash no dash how. Yeah, no, just so use twit.tv slash kh. <laughs> yeah. thank, you, thank you for that, Patrick. Yeah, you're going to find all of our notes there along with all of our back episodes as, long, as well as a place to subscribe. If you like the show, if you want to support us, please subscribe. Make sure you get the audio, the video versions into your devices of choice automatically each yeah. and every single week. It's, it's a way to shout back to us and say you like what we do. Uh, they can subscribe on YouTube, too. Yeah, it's always there. Yeah, YouTube.com slash knowhow. Also, don't forget that we have a social media group on Google+. Just go to Google+, and look for know-how. We've got over 10,000 kitas. Those are know-it-alls. Mm -hmm. People who are in different spots in their maker journey. If you're an expert, please come and help the people who are new to it. If you're brand new and you need help with a project or maybe need help coming up with a project, again, just go to, know, uh, go to Google+, look for know-how. There's an approval process so we can keep the spam out, but otherwise it's, uh, it's just a nice place to hang out. Finally, don't forget that you can find us also on Twitter. You can find me at twitter.com slash PadreSJ. And I'm twitter.com slash P. Delahanty. And we actually have another member of our group. She's a, she's a wonderful person. Um, a little bit crazy. I am. A little bit crazy, a little bit goofy. But, uh, you know, she is pure manky candy. Kara <laughs> Cole, yes. can you tell people where they can find you on the Twitters? Way back here behind the TD desk. You can find me on Twitter at Kara080. There you go. Until next time, I am Father Robert Balliser. And I'm Patrick Delahanty. And now that you glow how, glow do it. Glow do it.